in hacking RFID. I have Soccer here, one of the speakers, then we have Hendrik, and also, I forgot his name, sorry, Carsten, correct. Please welcome them to the session Hacking RFID. Yeah, I'm the first one, so please input on this notebook, please. This is the third part. Second. Oh, the second. Okay. Yeah, we will manage. Yes, hello. RFID is a main issue today, and uh, we have three parts in this lecture, in this uh, uh, part of the day. And first, I will tell you uh, uh, about an attempt uh, this, this summer to, to clone a ticket to get into a stadium at the FIFA World Cup 2006. The FIFA World Cup 2006, you probably know, was a major event in Germany. It was uh, the first massly use of RFID technology in, in, uh, in tickets. And uh, for example, it was uh, 46 matches in, in four weeks with 12 locations. That means stadiums all over Germany with uh, different uh, technology in, at the entrance. So in total, there were about 3 million tickets sold and uh, uh, delivered um, up to uh, 72,000 tickets for one event for the, for the, for the last game. The uh, technology was uh, delivered by Philips. You heard the, the, the word, the technology before in the lecture in this room here before. It was uh, MyFair. They used a MyFair Ultra Light. And uh, Philips is one of the main sponsors of the FIFA World Cup, was one of the main sponsors. So this is um, a picture of the, the, the ticket. Uh, I have placed it here to get an impression of the size. Um, this part, uh, the smaller ticket over here is uh, one standard credit card sized ticket and uh, that's how the tickets look from the outside. There is a small hologram over here and uh, well, the, the data is mostly written on the ticket which is uh, important. And this is the ticket on the inside. Thank you. Mm. So, I will try a live demo. So this is, um, you saw it from the outside, now we want to see what's, what's inside. I have here um, a standard OmniKey reader. I'll tell afterwards a little about the reader. And I have this ticket here. The, the, the RFID chip is placed on this part of the ticket. So. Let's see what's in the ticket, what's on the ticket. Hmm? Okay, this was to show you that I'm not lying. This is the original payload on the ticket. It's not that much, as you see. It's uh, 16 times four bytes, and we will take a closer look at the bytes. So first of all, we have here uh, a UID, unique ID, which is set at the factory, which we can't rewrite. Then we had a small part over here. This, this, those two bytes are fixed. And then we have the blue part is called the locking bits. This part is where you can uh, uh, set the rest of the, the, the uh, um, payload to read only, to read, uh, to read write, or write once. 
And the most interesting part we figured out, or one of the most uh, interesting part, is the green line below at uh, page three. Uh, this part is completely rewritable, freely, freely rewritable. So we have four bytes. And as we figured out yet, the first byte is the entrance uh, counter. The second byte is the uh, exit counter. And the other two bytes, well, we haven't figured out yet. <laughs> But um, as you see, this is the, uh, the status of, of the ticket when uh, the, uh, the user entered the stadium once and didn't get out. Because when we left after the match, there weren't no uh, extra controls for the, for the exit. They, everyone went, went home. <laughs> so the, uh, when the ticket is completely new, the first byte is set to zero. So then we have uh, some other parts of the, the ticket which uh, are more or less interesting. I want to concentrate on the, the blue ones. We have uh, here the match ID. It's the number of the match on the, uh, uh, on the World Cup. It was match number in decimal 43. And as you see, usually this is a, 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 a hex code, but um, the 43 is as a decimal coded in, in this uh, byte. Uh, this is called the BCD uh, coding. And uh, the next line contains three bytes of a country code. This is set to zero is set uh, to, to space, to nothing. Uh, uh, but we saw different tickets which had DEU for Deutschland, for Germany, or GBR for Great Britain in there. So this is a, a, a field where the, the ticket holder is, uh, is um, identified by nation, by country. For example, this is a... a, a a weakness if somebody passes with a USA ticket, then uh, somebody might harm this, this card holder or whatever. Think about it. And the other blue numbers are interesting. This is the ticket number, again, BCD coded. So this was, in fact, ticket number 12,775. And uh, the the last blue line over here. This was set to zero when we entered the stadium and it was filled up uh, uh, after the entry, after, yeah, uh, after the reading and the, the writing, after getting in the stadium. So probably this is a timestamp or uh, uh, the, the, a code for the, the entrance, the gate where you get in or whatever. Yeah. So. We have this Cartman 5121, which is uh, one off-the-shelf reader. You can order it at your favorite online store for less than 100 euro. Then we have this uh, great lib of ID uh, made by LaForge uh, on Linux, compiles very well. And then we have used tickets, you can get them in front of a stadium after a match and ask those who come out of the stadium and ask them for a souvenir and probably you are lucky you get one because they think, the, the, the guests think they are no, of no use anymore. And then we had one new and unused ticket. It's for Japan against Brazil. It uh, was hard to get <laughs> last year. Uh, well... <laughs> I could tell you, but I had to kill you where I got this ticket from. <laughs> and, um, and then we had, uh, thanks to LaForge again, we had uh, two MyFair Ultralight blank RFID chips, um, which, we, which you saw in a photo uh, in before. So we had this very simple approach 
uh, and the idea of cloning one ticket with those ing ingredients. Um, we had this, this uh, the simplest approach is to take the payload of the new and unused valid ticket and copy it onto the, the blank RFID chip, um, glue the blank RFID chip to a deactivated old ticket for the, the, yeah, for the manual controlling, the human controlling at the entrance. Uh, it should be, should be uh, uh, not recognizable that it's a fake. And then try to get in, a, in the stadium. The problem is, um, as, you, uh, as I mentioned before, the UID, the unique ID, is set by factory, so we couldn't change the, uh, this, this ID. To get clear, we had no success. The sensation uh, didn't take place. <laughs> um, we presented it at the entrance, and um, yeah, it was it uh, it gave no entry, a red light, and it was a little bit tricky because at the entrance they have guards and they try to get it, take it out of your hand, and uh, place it in front of the RFID reader. And it was a little bit tricky to get around this guard and to, to uh, present it to the reader myself um, because I didn't want to uh, give it out of my hand because it, uh, uh, a guard at the entrance could have um, see that it's a fake because of the weight and the, the size of the ticket, the prepared ticket, the clone. So uh, it was a little... Uh, 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 a try there, and it was uh, uh, hard to, to get there uh, with, the, with the tickets and not getting it out of the hand. And afterwards, uh, the guard was very uh, upset because there was a red light and he didn't see that before. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh boy, uh, this is the wrong ticket. This is my ticket of last week. Uh, so this is my real ticket. Oh, may I try it again? Oh, here. Oh, this is the green light. And then his uh, face relaxed and he said, oh boy, I didn't have that uh, in before. Oh, where's the old ticket from? Uh, may I have it for a souvenir? Oh, no, you may don't. You don't. <laughs> I won't give it to you. <laughs> so this is the, the main story. And Probably you are interested how the, the entrance and the stadium situation looked like, so I have a couple of, um, of, of photos here. First of all, to answer a question of the, the lecture before, if microwave ovens are a solution to disable an RFID chip, no, <laughs> they are not. <laughs> uh, this was my first attempt. I tried to pin and to disable the RFID chip, but I didn't get uh, to manage the, the, the disabling. So um, I put it in a, a microwave oven for just two seconds, and I thought, oh, it will do no harm to the ticket. But as you see here, um, it exploded a little bit in the <laughs> microwave ovens. This, are, this, are, um, this marks are really burned. It burned really down the, the ticket at that part. And this was a, a problem because everyone at the entrance could, could have seen this is a fake. And I tried to photocopy from the, the new one a piece of the ticket and to glue it over, but this was horrible. <laughs> so I was very lucky that I had a friend of a friend of a friend who had another old ticket and um, we prepared the, the, the new old ticket uh, like this. As you see, the blank RFID chip is a slightly um, bigger than the, the size of the, 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 the ticket, the, the real ticket. So um, I glued it in, in uh, landscape on the, um, on the ticket. And then here was again the, the trick with the, the photocopy uh, of, of the new ticket glued over it all, but when you when you take the new ticket or the prepared ticket in your hand, you probably 
uh, had noticed that it's, it's, it's more weight and it's thicker. The, um, the situation at the stadium, uh, ha it has uh, two rings, it had two rings. The outer ring is a human and manual control of the ticket if you have the correct uh, match printed on it and if the hologram is okay, intact. So there's no RFID reader. At this point, I presented the correct and new ticket, which I had. Then here you see in Dortmund um, the, the entrance of the RFID reader. On the left is the entrance reader, and on the, the right, oh, I don't think you, oh no, you can't read it. Uh, there is written, Auf Wiedersehen in Dortmund, which means goodbye in Dortmund. There is an exit reader, the, the right one, on the right side. Um, in before, they said it is impossible to, to leave the stadium and to re-enter it, but this proves it's, it was possible at least in, in, in Dortmund. And uh, this is the situation. The guard um, uh, tries to, to take the, he, he takes the ticket and um, he himself, uh, or he um, places, uh, places the ticket at the RFID reader. So it was a little bit tricky uh, to, to get around this and uh, this guard and to, to experiment for myself. This is a different um, a stadium, it's in Cologne. They, have, they use another um, uh, type of RFID reader which has a barrier in, uh, and you can't cross it that easy. And as you see here, the guard as well takes the, the ticket out of the hand of the, the, guest, the guest and uh, places, uh, places, uh, places the ticket inside this reader um, um, himself. So, conclusion. Um, what did we learn about this little experiment? The simple cloning didn't work. It had been a sensation uh, if, if they made it that easy for us. Um, but um, yeah, it was worth a try. We found an entrance and exit counter, uh, which makes possible if you enter a stadium and you smuggle out the, um, the, the, the ticket again and you have another person waiting outside of the, the, the stadium with a uh, RFID reader and writer and you manipulate the, the counter, you may enter again the stadium. And um, another approach could be that you don't use the, the quite dumb RFID uh, MIFRA ultralight chips, uh, which are just, yeah, uh, data storage. Um, you may use a programmable RFID chip which emulates uh, MIFRA ultralight, um, which then probably could um, emulate a unique ID. And uh, this is a, yeah, those are the IDs for the, the next field test at the Euro 2008, which will take place in Austria and Swiss. And if any one of you uh, is interested to uh, experiment with the next event, feel free to write me. Uh, feel free to ask questions. We have little time, so please, if you have important questions now, but uh, otherwise, just write down the questions in email and send it to me. And I uh, of course, I recommend uh, as the next lecture, the lecture on, in room, uh, on day four, at 4 p.m. in room four of uh, Harald Welte and Milos Meriak um, about the open PCD, open PIC uh, reader, the hardware project they have. So this is from my side. Oh, Henrik said it was on day three tomorrow. Do, do we have one quick question before we go on to the next talk? Which, yeah. Uh, moment. 
Did you find uh, some some um, some kind of cryptographic sec checksums on the cards in comparing uh, 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 the payload uh, of different uh, chips? No, we didn't try this one. Or did you? Can we get the other did set you? of slides, please? Well, I'll just start anyway. I'm Carson, University of Virginia. Um, this is an academic talk trying to answer some question around RFID privacy, um, a topic that Melanie already tipped on. And the talk is academic in the sense that none of the things I'm going to talk about has ever been built in hardware. As Melanie pointed out, industry couldn't care less about privacy at this point, and try, industry mainly tries to drive down the price for a given tech rather than incorporating privacy-preserving features. Um, what's the problem with RFID privacy? Um, if you have ever seen any talk on that topic, you probably know Mr. Jones, introduced by Ari Jules a couple of years ago. Mr. Jones lives in the future, and um, several of his belongings have RFID tags attached to him. And then that, as most people would think, contain privacy critical information. And so Mr. Jones obviously doesn't want this information to leak to rogue readers. Um, this was long thought of as, the, as, as the, the biggest RFID privacy problem. The solution to this is easy. You just assign random numbers, not well-structured numbers, to the text and, and index into some database that then contains the rest of the information. Now you want to protect the access to that database to, to keep that information private. A different RFID privacy problem that this talk is going to focus of, uh, on is the, the tracking of individuals. So Alice roams through some environment um, where a stalker has deployed rogue readers. And um, since the, the tag IDs, despite being random, don't change, the, the attacker can, can build a trace of a movement, which, from what I understand, and th this is something that... that um, business research has looked at recently, these traces are worth real money, similar to web traces, just in the real world. So the, there is an incentive for, for somebody to deploy readers for the, for the only purpose of, of harvesting traces and selling those traces. Um, what, what are information, what are sources of information that an attacker could incorporate into, into that attack of, of building traces? Well, mainly, and this is what most research has focused on, the, the protocol layer, the, 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 the communication between the reader and the attack. Obviously, if there's a, the, the same given ID transmitted every time, that by itself suffices for a tracking attack. Other um, sources of information, obviously the, the physical layer, antenna characteristics, other dimensions of, of the physical world that could, could be different for different techs can be included as sources of information in an attack. And then other side channel attacks, timing attacks, for example, um, you name it. This talk is mainly going to focus on the protocol layer, but I'll, towards the end, give an example of, of a physical layer source of information that we looked at. Um, what, what is a way to protect um, on the protocol layer the, the privacy of an RFID tag? So we assign cryptographic keys, secret keys, to each RFID tag. And on, uh, when being queried, the, the RFID tag generates a random number and nonce, hashes that random number with its secret key, sends both the random nonce and the hash to the reader. The reader now has the keys of all the tags that belong to it and tries every single of those keys on that, on that nonce to, to see which hash matches, thereby identifying the tag. A rogue reader, on the other hand, who doesn't know the, the set of secrets used by the tags, has to try basically all possible keys, brute force attack, which for a large enough key space is impossible. Um, flip side of this, this protocol, as the system grows to millions or even billions of tags, the reader has to try billions of keys on every, every query, which certainly doesn't scale well and, and will become very costly or even impossible. Um, so a more scalable version of this protocol assigns several keys to each tag that are structured into a tree. And in this case of a binary tree, the, the reader um, 
on each level of the tree identifies which half of, of the tree the tag belongs to until it, it um, eventually um, reaches a leaf node where the tag then is identified on. Um, the number of hashing operations in this scheme is only logarithmic in the number of, of tags, therefore much more scalable. It scales to billions or trillions of tags easily with, with a low-end uh, back-end system. It, Obviously, as everything in life has a flip side, um, since secrets are shared uh, among different tags, compromising the secrets on one tag break the privacy of other tags to some degree. And this is what, what my research a while ago looked at, to what degree um, the privacy of tags is compromised as, as um, secrets are stolen or extracted from, from a small number of tags. Um, let me first, before I go into the details, that describe the tech that, that we think has an incentive to, to um, execute an attack like this. So what the attacker wants is, is to correlate different readings of that same tech or of the tags that are carried by an individual to build a trace through the physical world. Um, the, the attacker as, as several advantages over, over previous research that we looked at. First of all, the attacker doesn't try to track a single tag. It, the attacker rather tries to track a, an individual through the physical world. And as Manley pointed out, every piece of clothes is going to have a tag in it. So you, you, you track a collection of tag that is likely to stay together at, at least through the course of a day, say. Um, at the same time, the, the focus of the attacker is usually limited to some, some fixed environment, say a department store or a soccer stadium, um, maybe even the city of Berlin, but definitely not all techs in the world, what, what has been thought of before as, as the, the attacker scenario. So all this leads us to conclude that we need a good understanding and a good metric to, to measure how much information the attacker can, can derive about different techs to, to then answer the question, how successful could an attacker be? Um, the metric that we came up with is, is built um, on top of um, inf information theory and entropy and simply says, if you, can, if you can divide the group of all tags into two equal sized subgroups, you learn one bit. So if you, could, if you could tell whether somebody is male or female, that would give you a single bit right there. And if you can different other groupings give you different other bit counts, it all falls out from entropy. I won't go into detail here. But using this, this, this metric now, we, we look at the, the tree protocol and, and try to answer, given a tree of tags, how, ma how many tags do I need to break or how much, how much information do I get through breaking tags? And again, information theory tells us we want to get like a close to uniform distribution it, of, of grouping sizes to get the most information. So an attacker wants to, wants to break um, secrets in, first of all, all every third of, of this, this toy tree. And then if we allow the attacker to break another attack, it doesn't really matter where that is placed as long as it's not immediately neighboring any of the already broken tags. So this example just um, generalized for, for all possible keys, uh, key trees and for, for all for, for any given number of broken um, tags gives us a grouping. So the, the red tags could be the, the ones that are broken where all secrets are known can be uniquely identified by, by reader. The others in, in groups of different sizes. Um, relating this back, using the, 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 the metric that we just introduced, we can, we can draw the, 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 the amount of leaked information um, over the number of broken tags for different system sizes. In this case, two system sizes, a thousand and ten million tags. And you see that for, for only a few dozen um, broken tags, you, you get on, on the order of four to six bits of information about every single tag in the system, about every of the ten million tags in the system, which we already saw was a surprising result. So this is still assuming that an attacker can, can pick the optimal optimal text to break. We also simulated the case where the taker more randomly gets, gets secrets assigned that, that he's breaking. And, and you see that these results fall very close, typically within 10% of each other. And every attacker would, would be somewhere in between those two extremes. 
um, we still haven't answered the question of how successful an attacker would actually be launching an attack. And now we, we pick up this notion that we introduced earlier that, that an attacker has a, has a limited focus, right? like a football stadium or even a single room where, where he wants to track people. And looking at the case where, where the attack focuses only 10 tags, very small group of tags, and the attacker goal being defined as tracking half of those 10 tags, meaning five tags, um, the attacker probability is extremely high for, for a small number of broken tags already. But if we want to look at, at, at larger groups of tags, um, we can take the idea of multiple tags per individual first and say, oh, well, why not assume five? Every piece of clothes, remember. So five tags per person. Um, looking at a group of, ten, uh, of a thousand tags, wanting to track 500 of those, we have a high probability, again, for a small number of of broken tags. Um, we, the attack is still possible for, for um, 10,000 tags. If you, if you go further, 100,000, a million more, more encouraging scenarios for an attacker, you'd have to include different other sources of information. Again, we only looked at the protocol layer here with a privacy preserving protocol, okay? Um, one, one other source of information that we looked at the physical layer. Um, we wanted to, to answer the question, how different do tags behave? And tags don't all look the same. There's very different antenna shapes and sizes. And we just ran probably the, the most simple approach. We, we sweeped through some spectrum, 2 to 18 gigahertz, and, and um, measured the response of the tags, um, trying to, to find out how different these, these tags behave. And you, you can see the variance. I only uh, drew the variance in this picture. And, um, this is, these are very different tags. The variance among very similar tags, much lower. So from this alone, you could derive a bit or two. And again, this is the most simple approach to, to physical layer um, grouping of tags. You, you could easily derive three, five, maybe ten bits of information if you include it as a side channel attack. So all, all this together leads us to think that, that even though a, a privacy-preserving protocol is employed, Tracking attacks on, on tens of millions of attacks would be very possible. Um, but even, even if that, was, that problem was solved, and, and we, if, we, if we move our focus a little bit further away from the, the tech to reader and also include the, the backend system, the, the whole RFID system consisting of, of text to readers to, to database in the backend, um, we find something that EPC introduced a while ago and that they're testing right now that's going to. Um, go into production sometime soon, the ONS, the object name service, which not only by name is similar to the DNS, it actually is the DNS system with some, some additional layer on top of it. And what it does is um, it tells you for a given tag number which IP address you have to query to get information. So it translates a name into an IP address, straightforward DNS. So a, a tag would send its identity to the reader, the reader would cut off some some serial number and send that into the ONS and get, get the pointer to an IP address where, where the information is stored. Um, if we look at the privacy of, of this scheme, um, if, if Alice again uh, roams through some environment and these are now trusted uh, readers, did all, all secured with, with a potentially privacy preserving protocol, these readers will have to, to query the, the ONS and, and derive at that one IP address where uh, where the information is stored about that tag. And now the attacker sitting at this computer gets the, the, the location information of Alice's tags delivered home for free, is just waiting for the incoming packets. And as, as you probably know, IP addresses somehow correlate to physical locations. Usually you can at least find the, the country, usually the, the more fine-grained location too. So, Definitely, th this scheme allows for extremely efficient and cheap tracking of people by just waiting for incoming packets. Well, this is assuming that, that an attacker will sit at one of these nodes. So, say they were all trusted too. Um, we can include an idea that was presented here a year ago by Dan Kaminsky, who's, by the way, going to give a talk tonight too. I'm excited about that. Um, where he exploited the caching capabilities of DNS servers. So, say Alice again. Um, 
passes by that reader, the, the reader queries the DNS server, the DNS server passes back that information through the hierarchy, through the chain of servers. This, this information is going to be stored at, at every of the, of the DNS servers on the pass. So an attacker, a totally passive attacker outside of the system, doesn't own any of the servers, can now go ahead and query different servers to find out at which location Alice has been recently and at which not, okay? So just by sending out some DNS packets, and this is not a theoretical attack, then exactly did that to uh, get some more information about the, the Sony rootkit on the audio CDs. Um, so in conclusion, um, different, <laughs> different layers of the RFID systems leak different amounts of information, and, and an overall attack is, is much more likely to be successful than previously thought. What we do need is a good understanding and good metrics to, to, to measure how much information an attacker can derive from different layers, in which way this can be combined, and, and how to protect privacy. Well, I drew a fairly dark picture of all this, and, and in addition to that, industry at this point doesn't seem to, to care much, but hopefully through, through approaches like um, the, the RFID Guardian that we saw in the last talk, um, RFID privacy will be regained if enough people are being aware and enough people go out and talk to industry about it. Well, again, I, I, I'm very happy to take a single quick question before Henrik is going to talk about more applied attacks on RFIDs. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Oh, that's going. Hello and good evening. Oh, microphone is working. Beamer is working too. So everything's fine. Um, I'm going to talk about an. Um, formerly unknown access control system that was deployed at my university. Um, I didn't know anything about the system. I just had a card like this, um, the unmarked so you don't know which university. The system is manufactured by NEDA, by, uh, by the way. We may have heard one thing or the other about that company yesterday. Um, but I didn't know anything more. I knew I had a card. I had a door, and when I put the card in front of the door, the door opens. That's all. Um, first thing I did is um, use a high-power light source to um, try to look through the card to see the antenna, which is kind of hard to photograph, so I used uh, some trick. This is... Uh, I hope you can uh, see this. Um, there. This is the antenna where the light doesn't go through. And it's quite a thick one. If you compare this to a 13.56 megahertz device, which has uh, way, way, way fewer windings in the antenna coil. So um, the card I had had a lot of windings, which kind of indicates it might be low frequency, relatively low frequency. So what do I do? And um, I'm going step by th step through the process, so maybe you can use it as kind of a blueprint to do funny things at your location. Um, first thing we need to do is find the carrier. Luckily, I had a GNU radio and the USRP to my uh, disposition, which is kind of a scanner. It's um, a really, really thick digi uh, analog digital converter with a radio frequency front end, so you can look at almost everything in the radio frequency spectrum. I, had an, uh, I needed to have an antenna. I just used one by Milos, which he built last year for his RFID uh, project, which is tuned to 13.56 megahertz, but that doesn't matter. The carrier is supposed to be really strong and should be going through this antenna too. So I used the GNU radio and USRP and this antenna and put the antenna next to the door, 
where is uh, Transceiver, Transceiver, which you saw on the last slide, and just looked at the lower end of the radio spectrum. This is a okay. You, you can see that. See that. This is a waterfall display. On this axis, there's the time. This axis is the uh, frequency. About here is uh, zero hertz, uh, null. Um, ignore this one. I tuned the USRP to 100 and kilo, 100 kilohertz. So just ignore this line. And this is the carrier. As you can see, it's a really strong carrier at 120 kilohertz was uh, really exactly 120 kilohertz, so three hertz above or so. Uh, you can also look at the waveform view, which uh, just you just see a fine sinus curve. That's the carrier. Now, next step. I know that these uh, transponder cards are supposed to have some kind of ID identifier because uh, they need to be identified after all its radio frequency identification. So I might want to capture the identifier and um, the um, exchanges between door and uh, transponder card. What I did, I just put the card next to the door, next, next to the door transceiver. And you see the uh, spectrum changes carrier is still here and there is data left and right of it. This uh, view doesn't show a lot. The next, uh, this one is way better. As you can see, the uh, amplitude changes, which indicates lot modulation. So the uh, card only does lot modulation as nearly every card out there does, which was ex expected which you maybe have seen is um, that the door doesn't do anything. It just transmits its carrier. No communication from the door transceiver whatsoever. And the card um, gives back its response as a lot modulation, um, which then looks like amplitude modulation in the, um, on the carrier. So you might want to demodulate the signal so that you can see it better. I used the GNU Radio uh, toolkit and uh, one of the components already does amplitude demodulation. And what you get is a fine amplitude demodulated signal. This is the data that the card sends, which was then lot modulated onto the carrier. If you look at this and if you looked at different waveforms before, you might recognize that it's probably Manchester encoded. It's quite characteristic that there are uh, highs, highs and lows and that there are highs and lows of different lengths, but always one of two lengths and either short or long. This is quite characteristic for Manchester encoding. I'm not sure that everybody knows how Manchester encoding works. It's basically that the, um, the, um, there are time slot bit, dura bit durations, and in each bit duration you transmit one bit, and in the middle of each bit duration there is an edge, either upwards or downwards. And the information is encoded in whether the uh, edge goes upwards, then it's maybe a zero or one, doesn't matter, you have to define that. And if it goes downwards, then it's a zero, for example. On the beginning and end of bit duration, there might be edges too, but they, those don't carry any data. So if you look at this, let's say um, a bit duration is from here to here, then there's an edge, it goes downwards, and let's say that's an one. Next bit duration is from here to here, goes upwards, might be a zero. Next bit duration from here to here goes upwards, might be another zero, and so on. This is uh, pretty zoomed in. You can see uh, single bits. If you zoom out a little bit, you might recognize that this signal seems to be periodic. There is a pretty characteristic block here of long high, long low, long high, long low, long high, and the same block is here. 
and indeed that seems to be periodic with a period length of about 68 microseconds, which might be important later. Let's see what we have up to here. We found out that the door transceives a strong, strong, strong carrier at 120 kilohertz, that the car transmits its identification code using lot modulation as soon as it enters the field without any querying from the door transceiver or anything else, and that the identification code is looped as long as the card is powered up, as long as it is in the field. Especially what we see is that there is no challenge response or anything complicated, so it should be fairly easy to replicate this thing. But first let's try to decode the signal that is sent to see whether there's any interesting data in it. Because on these cards there's a small number printed on it. And I only have my card and some, um, some friends gave me their cards to sample them. So I only had four cards uh, at all. And I maybe want to generate, see whether I can generate codes for other cards that I hadn't seen yet. Which might be an interesting feature. But first I need to understand what is sent. Therefore, I need to find um, um, the period length because, as I said, the signal seems to be periodic. So let's find out whether it is really periodic and what the period length is because this will be the identification code in one period. To, use this, I used, uh, to find this, I used an autocorrelation of the data, which is a common technique to find the period. The formula is uh, not important. You can look it up in Wikipedia or wherever. The important thing is the graph that comes out. I used the autocorrelation over the data that came from my card. And this is also a characteristic image that you should look for. There is some no noise down here. And there are high spikes, which are really high compared to the noise, at exactly the periods. This is about 17,000, about 33,000, about 510,000, something like this. You see that uh, this seems to be periodic. Indeed, if you look at the data, there are maxima, these uh, spikes in the graph are at 17,067 samples, 34,132 samples, 51,200 samples, and so on. I had used a sampling rate of 250,000 uh, hertz, uh, 250 kilohertz, which makes these period lengths to be about 68.255 milliseconds. And now it's the interesting point. If you compare this period length with the carrier signal, which is at 120 kilohertz, you see that 68.26666 milliseconds are uh, exactly 8,192 uh, periods of the carrier, which seems to be a good sign because these RFID cards don't have an uh, own clock. They just use the carrier and um, use a divider on the carrier signal to get their clocks. And if you have such a nice power of two, then it seems to be the right signal, right period length. Later on, you might, now that you know that a signal is periodic, you might try to perform periodic averaging to get out the noise from the signal, but that turned out not to be necessary. The signal was perfectly and crystal clear. So now I know the period length of the identifier. Now I need to find the um, bit length of um, the Manchester encoded data, if it really is Manchester encoded. I've prepared here some random Manchester encoded data so you can see the characteristics of Manchester. As I said before, up, zero, down, one, up, zero, down, one, for example, up, zero, up, zero, up, zero. You see that there are only two different lengths, either up or uh, high or low, long and uh, short, and that the bit length is exactly two times the short duration or one time the long duration. So I just need to look at the signal, measure how long either an up or down signal is, and then I should get the bit duration. I did that, and it uh, turned out to be about 532 
microseconds, which interestingly again is 64 periods of the carrier. So another nice uh, power of two, great. This also means that in this identification code there are 128 bits and they are transmitted at 1870 kilobits uh, bits per second, which is fairly low data transfer rate. Um, yeah, now I might try to decode the identifier to find uh, interesting information in it. I, as I said already, I got some friends to lend me their cards and had gathered four cards uh, in total. Let's call them A, B, C, and D. Uh, there was one problem because the identifier is looped and I don't know where one period starts. Just over and over the same signal. Um, I decided that the signal I pointed you to you before, this uh, long, 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 seems to be some sort of, uh, of synchronization code. So I just shifted my signal so that they all start at the same synchronization sequence. And that didn't look right. Of my four cards, two, A and B, seem to be um, almost identical, uh, except for about 40 bits, which is to be expected if there is the identifier encoded. And the other two cards, C and D, seem to be identical too, except for about 40 bits. But both cards are um, nearly complementary. One has long strings of zeros and the other has long strings of ones. So that didn't look right. After some pondering, I found out that there's not only Manchester encoded data, but differential Manchester encoding, which on the wire looks exactly like Manchester encoding, but has different semantics. Um, so I just decoded that data as differential Manchester encoding, and that turned out to be right. All cards were nearly identical, except for about 50 bits where the identifier is included. And um, now let's see whether we can, can find the printed number in there somewhere. After looking at a lot of zeros and ones, I found that, for example, for our card 523, there's a 5 here, BCD encoded, 0, 5, and uh, 2, 3 is here, which in all other cards was the printed identifier was at the same position. So that seems to be the position of the printed identifier. I hadn't yet time to look at the other data. Maybe there are some interesting things there, or where maybe I can just change these bits and get another card or something. That was the theory, uh, not very far. Now um, I have the most interesting part of this uh, talk. Remember what we said before, the ID identifier is transmitted with a lot modulation, which is simple to make. It's transmitted in a loop and it's transmitted without challenge and response. So, uh, as I said, it should be easy to replicate. Mm -hmm. You need a load modulation circuitry, which basically consists of a coil and a capacitor. These two need to be um, tuned to each other to um, have the right frequency, 120 kilohertz, as I said. So this is basically a matched antenna. Then you need the load to do load modulation, which is simply a resistance. And the modulation is provided by a field effects transistor, which simply switches this trans, uh, resistance on and off. I had done some calculations to get the right number of windings for my coil and the right uh, uh, capacitance. And in the end, I found a good pair turned out. I got the formulas from the excellent RFID handbook that Melanie already mentioned. Unfortunately, there was one of the numbers uh, off by an order of 10. So um, when I had my capacitance, I needed to make a coil of uh, 400 windings, which was a bit too much for me. I then got another capacitance, which only needed uh, 15 windings, which is okay. And then, of course, I need the load modulation data to into this system. I need to put it in somehow. As I said, it's uh, 1.8 kilobits. The highest frequency is therefore something about 3.7 kilohertz, which is 
good in the audio range, so I just need some generic audio source to get the data in there. Mm, turns out an iPod matches. <laughs> I uh, prepared my signal from my card. I prepared the signal from my card so that it was a WAV file, loaded that WAV file onto my iPod and uh, put that onto my uh, contraption which I, which I built. <laughs> mm. Oh, I'll show you the WAV file which I generated if the audio will work. Doesn't look, doesn't sound nice, but it works. <laughs> this I put on my iPod, and then next I put this thing to the door, next to the door. Um, I have a video of that. If we can pull up the sound, this is going fairly low uh, in the sound. That's the door, it's closed. Okay, mm, some outlook for the future, maybe find out something more about the identifier that's encoded there, maybe find out whether I can generate new cards or find the identifier of some cards of important people that open more doors than mine. <laughs> and what I originally wanted to do for this, is, uh, for this Congress is to look at the MIFA algorithms that uh, Melanie already mentioned. It's not only in, in the Netherlands, it's all over the world. For example, we have this Mensa card, which we can pay with at the uh, Mensa, at the university. It's a MIFA system. And I um, saw that they use a simple stream th cipher with a CRC for a check, which means they have confidentiality but no integrity. In principle, I, could, I should be able to change data in the air. For this, I need a relay or a tunnel or wormhole installation, which consists of a reader and a tag. Um, the, tech, uh, the reader site is already finished, that's the open PCD of uh, LaForge and Milos. Um, tomorrow in their talk they will uh, ta probably talk about the uh, tech site, which is the open PICC. And once these are finished, I figure I should be able to play with these more. So go to the talk tomorrow and uh, help them and give them your applause. So, thanks for listening. We don't have too much time left. Uh, it's just on the mark. Maybe some questions if there are. Okay. Fine. Thanks. Ciao.